Welcome to True Crime Garage. Wherever you are, whatever you are doing, thanks for listening. I'm your host, Nick, and with me, as always, is a man that, much like myself, would like to point out that True Crime Garage is the only brick and mortar in the business. Ladies and gentlemen, the cap. We have many bricks and many mortars, but they're not connected, so you figure it out. It's good to be seen and good to see you. Thanks for listening. Thanks for telling a friend. This week, we are enthused to be featuring Dark Lord by the brilliant brewers over at Three Floyds Brewing. Dark Lord is a demonic Russian-style imperial stout brewed with coffee, Mexican vanilla, and Indian sugar. This beer defies description, but not a garage grade, which we say is a solid four and three quarters bottle caps out of five. Dark Lord has an ABV of 15%, so enjoy at home and say a prayer or two during consumption. And let's give some thanks and praise to our friends that helped us fill up the old garage fridge for this week's show. First up, a shout out to Summer Price from Spartanburg, South Carolina. And a big We Like Your Jib goes out to Cole Switzer from Edmonton, Alberta, Canada. And we also have a cheers to Clara from Boston. And here's a cheers to Skylar Gorski from Denver. And last but certainly not least, we have a double-fisted cheers to Andy and his cat Penny in New Orleans. Everyone we just mentioned, they went to truecrimegarage.com and helped us fill up the fridge for this week's show. And for that... We thank you. Yeah, B-W-E-W-R-U-N, Beer Run. If you need more True Crime Garage for your earballs, make sure you subscribe to us on Patreon or Apple subscription. And Colonel, that's enough of the beers and ass. All right, everybody, gather around, grab a chair, grab a beer. Let's talk some true crime. Family is everything. When times get tough, there is nothing like having supportive parental figures to help guide you to adulthood. In the life of Clyde and Jean Delaney, that figure was undoubtedly her parental grandmother, Nancy Warren. In the absence of steady, committed biological parents, Nancy offered her granddaughter a stable upbringing and a loving household. Not only when she became unexpectedly pregnant when she was just a teenager, but long after, even when Clyda was an adult with three children of her own. Which is why the horrifying events that occurred in the dark, rainy hours on the night of Sunday, October 13th, 1968, were all the more tragic. This is True Crime Garage. And this is the still unsolved case of the bedside murders. The following is told from the perspective of Johnny Usry. I knew I was late waking that morning because I could see that the sun was shining through my bedroom window. Normally, when I wake, it is still mostly dark out, but that morning the sun was already up and out, and that normally hasn't happened yet when I wake up. I got out of bed and I went out of my room, looking for my mother. So I walked into my mother's bedroom, and I immediately noticed that her bed was still made. I thought that this was weird, because to me, it meant that nobody had slept in the bed. My mother's purse was open and sitting on the bed, the contents of which had been dumped out, not in a pile, but spread throughout all over my mother's bed. Of course, none of this made any sense. The sun shining through my window, my mom's bed still made from the night before, and her purse dumped. I wasn't sure what was going on, or frankly, what I was supposed to do. So I decided to go outside. I was still in my pajamas and barefoot, but I went outside anyway. I was looking for my mom. My grandmother lived in her trailer, 
by herself. Right next door, my mother, me, and my two little brothers lived in a separate trailer. We always went over there to my grandma's for meals and to hang out and stuff. There was a gravel walkway between our trailer and my grandmother's trailer. When I stepped outside right away, I saw my mom. She was lying on the gravel between the two trailers. She wasn't moving. I ran to her and knelt down. Something was around her neck. I screamed. I screamed as loud as I could, but it was of no use. Not to her, not to me. She was gone. The thing about that moment that I'll never forget is that my mom, she was a blonde, a true blonde, almost platinum. And lying there with no life left in her, she looked different to me. Her face was so pale that it was almost the exact same color as her hair, the same color as her almost white hair. She, my mom, was all white, and she was dead. I can remember it like it was yesterday. I screamed like crazy, and I got up, and I ran to my grandmother's trailer. Now, in this exact moment, I don't know if I was still screaming or not, but I can remember watching my hand twist the doorknob and it opened with ease. I pulled the door open and I stepped inside. The first thing that I noticed was that the television was on, but the screen was all fuzzy. Then I saw her lying there the same way as my mom. I was frightened, so I ran out of there, but I couldn't stand the thought of seeing my mother again the way she was. So I decided to run out of the back of my grandmother's trailer. And then I ran around to the back of ours. I went inside and I woke up my two brothers. I dressed them both as quick as I could. I was going to get them out of there. We were just about to leave when something stopped me. I will never understand why, but something compelled me to stop and grab the three piggy banks that we kept on top of the refrigerator. I handed one to each of my brothers and now with A piggy bank in each of our arms, we ran, the three of us, to the neighbor's house. Me being the oldest, I pounded on the door. When the neighbor opened up, I told them that my mommy and my grandma were dead. A short time later, I remember staring out the window, looking across the field at the two trailers, and seeing all of the cop cars. I was eight years old. Captain, these murders, as described by the little eight-year-old boy, Johnny Ussery, are at times referred to as the bedside murders. Now, from the description that we just provided, that's not such a great name. Mrs. Clyda Delaney, age 24, this is Johnny's mother, she was found dead having been strangled, just as he described, lying on some gravel in the short distance between these two trailers. Nancy Warren, who Johnny is calling grandma in this description, she is 65 years old and she's actually Clyda's grandmother. So Johnny's great grandmother, but he called her grandma. She, Nancy was found in the living room area of her trailer. She too strangled, but there was a significant amount of blood around her. She's was found lying in a pool of her own blood. And in some reports, they state that this pool of blood is about four feet in diameter. This took place near Ukiah, California. The bodies were found on Monday, October 14th, 1968. That is why the little boy was saying that he knew that he was late because this was a school day for him. And he was used to his mother waking him for school, as we just heard. And that did not happen on this day. So if the bedside murders isn't a good name, where did it come from? And what do you think it should have been called? Well, I I don't have an opinion on what it should be called, but they neither victim was found in their bed or next to their bed. One victim outside, one in the living room. But we can surmise here, Captain, that the the name likely comes from the original newspaper headline about this story. And that headline was Ukiah mother and daughter found strangled in their beds, which we know wasn't true. Now, keep in mind back then in a lot of the different parts of our country, the newspaper newspaper business was huge. And sadly, that's not the case anymore. The newspaper business was so big 
And so many people bought papers and read papers that they, in many parts of the country, they were putting out a morning paper and an evening paper. And we've seen this with a lot of other cases from the 50s and 60s that we've talked about over the years where you get this reporting. They're, they're really wanting to get the story out, but they, they don't really have all of the information or the information that they get is just not good information because it's a rush to get this story out, right? These bodies are found 7.30 a.m., maybe 8 a.m. at the latest by the time we have authorities on the scene and, and going through the scene. And this is in the evening paper, which still has to be an article written, a statement taken, and then the paper printed and delivered to everybody. So a quick turnaround would lead to this being called the bedside murders with the detail, the incorrect detail of the two being found strangled in their beds. William, we have to remember too that newspapers were a lot bigger because a lot of households didn't even have television sets. Now, little Johnny had just turned eight years old. This was just days prior. So in many of the reports, he is said to be seven. This is Mendocino County, California. Persons who follow this show will remember that this is the same general area that we were talking about with parts of the duo serial killers case, Leonard Lake and Charles Ng, but obviously years before those abductions and murders began. Now, we need to go through a little bit of a background here on our victims. Nancy Warren, the older of the two victims, the grandmother or great-grandmother, she's Clyda's grandmother and the great-grandmother of the three boys that were forced to flee the trailer on that fateful day. Now, when most people think of great-grandmothers or great-grandparents, they think of persons in their 80s or maybe their 90s. Nancy, by all accounts, was 64 or 65 years old. She was the owner operator of Nancy's antique shop. Some reports say that it was called Warren's antique shop, which would be her last name. This is located, this little store, this antique shop was located near the two trailers. That's going to make things complicated for investigators as well, because there's the 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 motive in this case here, Captain, for either of these victims to have been killed is still highly debatable to this very day. One thing we have to keep in mind, too, that antique shop that she owned and ran, this is very near Highway 101. We've talked about this with bank cases or anytime we have a victim where their home is very near the freeway. That lends itself to being maybe a random crime, somebody driving by, somebody from the area or not even from the area. And so this case gets complicated just by the proximity to the highway as well. The descriptions I found state that this antique store was approximately two to 300 yards from the freeway. So it's very close, not far at all. Now, Nancy Warren, the older of the two victims, she was the owner of both of the trailers that the family was living in at the time. Nancy's in one trailer and Clyda and the three little boys in the other. Clyda, who, as reported, has the last name of Delaney. She would have been just 16 or 17 when she had her first son, Johnny. Johnny and the other two little boys, their father is John Usry. He had done some prison time for stealing cattle. And at the time of these murders was living in Oregon. So he's living in a different state. The two had divorced. And I believe it was just about two years before the murder that they, they had separated and the divorce was final, but it should be noted that he was seeking full custody of the three boys, but wasn't having any success on that front. My guess would be him having committed a crime that lands his butt in prison is probably standing in the way of him having full custody of his three sons. From what little information there is, the marriage was not great. So the two separated, but the boys were very 
and I can't express this enough, very fond of their father, saying that it was like Christmas every time that he came around. They always say that they were very excited to see him. So I, I, I'm guessing that meant that when, when dad showed up, when he was around, when they got to see him, that meant probably gifts. He's probably showing up with some gifts. And I would have to guess, too, given the distance between them and their father, the visits were probably few and far between. And we all know how much little kids would look forward to a visit of mom or dad, especially when it's not so frequent. Investigators got their hands full on this case because, like you said, you have the business not far from where they live. So then it becomes a question of, is this a personal attack? Is this attack connected to the business in some way, shape, or form? And then when you're doing your investigation, what is missing? Is there anything missing from the homes or the business? And the other thing too, that we need to go through here is that based off of his description, right? We'll, we'll know more details as we go along, but just based off of little Johnny's description, we know that the killer or killers, I want to be clear about that because there's a lot of thought that this was at least a two person job, the killer or killers. We can surmise from his description that they entered both trailers, right? They had to go into Nancy Warren's trailer. She was found dead inside her trailer. Now, Clyda was killed and found lying between the two trailers, but the little boy says that his mother's purse had been dumped and scattered about on her still made bed. And so that would be indicative to me that the person was inside that trailer at some point. Now, the antique shop itself, while it is very close in proximity to these two trailers, was never entered that night. And that's a statement coming from not family, not anybody that has anything to hide. That's coming from law enforcement. They say that the, the antique store, nobody went into that store during the time of the murders. Back to the background here, captain. It looks to me like the father, John, that they were so fond of the three boys. I believed, I believe he did raise the three boys after Clyda was killed. So that that's going to be very problematic for him as a suspect, right? It's widely known at the time that he's seeking full custody of these three kids, not having any success on that front. But the result of the murder is he ends up with custody of his three children. Yeah. And it makes you wonder what was the court saying to him to begin with? Were they saying, even if she wasn't around. The custody would go to the, the grandma. So then that would be motivation to kill both individuals. True. I, I would imagine that they're probably not even worried about next to kin when he's filing and trying to get and seeking full custody because the, the simple answer is going to be you went to prison. Here's this woman, the mother, the biological mother of these three kids. She's more fit deemed to be more fit by the courts to raise them than you are. And we all know that dollars to donuts, especially back in the day, a lot of times, even if you're standing on even ground, the mother may get majority custody. I wouldn't say full custody, but majority custody. Now we do know that he was able to see his sons. Now, did that mean overnight visits? Did that mean longer stays at his place that I can't speak to. But what I can say is that after this divorce, remember this is about two years prior to the murders, Nancy, our other victim, Clyda's grandmother, we should point out that Clyda's biological mother, which would, which would be Nancy's daughter was pretty much absent for most of Clyda's life, especially her adult life. So Nancy, the grandmother insisted that Clyda and the boys live in the other trailer. I would imagine she says for as long as you need, but at some point, you know, this is an older woman. This is a lot of responsibility that she's taking on. We do know that Clyda was dating, maybe even recently married to another guy. This is Donald Delaney. So that's the explanation for why her last name is Clyda Delaney at the time. 
Donald is in his 40s. He has a daughter. She is in, she's a young teenager at the time of the murders. His daughter lived with him. So the two live in an apartment. The marriage, let's just say, is debatable because we have some say that they were married and others say that there was no official marriage license. But it could very well be that sh- that she was married. But what we do know is that she's using his last name. And after the murders take place, the newspapers are saying that the two were married. Now, as this story goes, Captain Donald, who was more than 20 years older than Clyda, the two were, were dating and she gets pregnant. It was said that the two went to Reno, Nevada to get married, just the two of them at the insistence of some of Clyda's family members. Why weren't the two living together? Well, that could be a very important piece of the murder puzzle here. Donald said that they would all five of them be living together if he could afford to get a house big enough for this new family. He said that he was in the process of house hunting, according to some. And according to others, he said he simply could not afford a house big enough for the family. Donald was a California Highway Patrol officer. So they lived separate but would hang out together frequently. Clyda was eight months pregnant when she was murdered. So more fittingly so, we should call this a triple murder case. Because regardless of who the killer is and regardless of how this whole thing went down, at that point, you have to know that you are killing a soon-to-be mother carrying a baby. Yeah, even though the business trailer wasn't entered, that doesn't mean that that wasn't a connection in this attack. But then you have this pregnant woman, which she's married or not married. Rachel says they're together. Ross says they're on a break. Do we have any sign of sexual assault? Because that could be a possible motive in this crime. No, we have no sexual assault on either of the two victims. With big wireless providers, what you see is never what you get. Somewhere between the store and your first month's bill, the price magically skyrockets. With Mint Mobile, you'll never have to worry about gotchas again. When Mint Mobile says 15 bucks a month when you purchase a three-month plan, they mean it. I do not like to do business with anyone or any entity that provides me with complicated bills, upcharges, and is constantly increasing their monthly fees. It's dishonest. It's bad business practices. Mint Mobile is not that. All Mint Mobile plans come with high-speed data and unlimited talk and text delivered on the nation's largest 5G network. You can use your own phone, your own phone number, and all of your existing contacts. Ditch overpriced wireless with Mint Mobile's deal and get three months of premium wireless service for 15 bucks a month. To get this new customer offer and your new three-month premium wireless plan for just 15 bucks a month, go to mintmobile.com slash TCG. That's mintmobile.com slash TCG. Cut your wireless bill to 15 bucks a month at mintmobile.com slash TCG. $45 upfront payment required, equivalent to $15 per month. New customers on first three-month plan only, speed slower above 40 gigabytes on unlimited plan. Additional taxes, fees, and restrictions apply. See Mint Mobile for details. Imagine a burglary at your home. If you're picturing a shady character sneaking about under the cloak of night, you may be surprised to learn that according to the FBI, most break-ins happen during broad daylight and spike during the summer when more homes sit unattended and the days grow longer. That's why you need Simply Safe Home Security now. With fast protect monitoring and live guard protection, Simply Safe agents can act within five seconds of receiving your alarm and can even see and speak to intruders to stop them in their tracks. You'll never be locked into a long-term contract, so you can cancel at any time. Pricing is transparent and affordable at less than $1 per day with no hidden fees ever. 
It's easy to install and activate your Simply Safe system in less than an hour or choose professional installation to have a pro do it for you. I love Simply Safe's tech and especially the peace of mind that I have with Simply Safe's home and property security protection. Whether I'm in for the night, leaving town for a vacation, or just driving to the garage, I just set it and forget it knowing that I am protected. Protect your home this summer with 20% off any new Simply Safe system when you sign up for Fast Protect monitoring. Just visit simplysafe.com slash garage. That's simplysafe.com slash garage. There's no safe like Simply Safe. All right, we are back. Cheers, mates. Cheers. Now, the call came in to the sheriff's office just after 7.30 a.m. that morning, after little Johnny found both mom and great-grandma dead and packed up his little brothers and headed to the neighbor's house. Sheriff Reno Bartolome and a cadre of officers arrived on the scene and began the investigation. Sheriff Bartolome labeled the case top priority. The reports are that he assigned his top man. This is senior investigator Earl friend to the case. This particular area, while they do have, so when we say senior investigator or top man, he does have plenty of homicide investigation experience, but they don't, this is not an area where they have, dozens of homicides every year from my understanding it it's roughly one maybe two a year so not a an area that sees a lot of this type of violence or this level of violence we should say both women had been beaten and strangled with a leather boot lace now before we venture too far along this report the reporting in this case kind of drove me a little mad. The truth is both women were strangled with a leather, what I would describe as a leather boot lace. Several of the reports say that they were garroted with a leather thong. And so to me, the word thong is much different than a boot lace and garroted is much different than strangled. To me, when I look at a case and I see strangled, it's kind of pardon the term, but murder 101, right? The, mo- most people kill someone for just a very limited um, number of reasons, either either greed, revenge, hate or anger, or to cover up another crime. And that that's what gets wonky here because we have two victims. There's a, a strong likelihood here that one victim was killed simply because the other one was killed collateral damage garroted to me is very far from murder 101 that is sexual sadism that's a whole different monster the newspapers at the time appear to be using the word garrot and strangle and interchangeably and they're right. not it, it's it's an incorrect statement Okay, like where with a garrote, you're now you you're using another tool. You're using some kind of tool. Right. Usually it's like a stick or or sometimes a branch or something of that nature, maybe even a pipe to use to twist and to turn to to cause that strangulation with that tool. And I say sexual sadism because a lot of times when this type of method is used, they are are releasing and then tightening and releasing and tightening to cause maximum suffrage. But as far as do we have this murder weapon, was this murder weapon left at the scene of the crime? Both were found with the, with an item still wrapped around their neck. Right. So does that to you, does that point to more than one individual? Cause it seems a little strange to me that they'd have, they both have something wrapped around their neck. Well, what seems the most strange to me is that the way that it's described is that both, both items were 
left at the scene, left around the necks of the women, and they the item is identical. That's why I'm underlining and and pointing out to the listeners here, leather boot laces by far the best way to describe this particular item. So if you look up the the technical definition of thong, right? Like I'm, we're not talking about Cisco's thong song from right. Uh, can you believe that song is like over 20 years old now? That Doesn't that make you feel old? It seems like it came out yesterday. Yeah, he's not. we're not talking about like a leather thong, like underwear type. And then some people might even refer to sandals or something of that nature as as a thong. We're not talking about anything like that. It This, this item, I've seen pictures of it. It's 36 inches in length and it's, it's made out of leather. I'm calling it a boot lace. It, it technically, you don't, you wouldn't. I don't know that you would see this for a boot lace. the The thing that I would think you would see this the most of, like right when you go to festivals, concerts, and what have you, you might see this item being fashioned into some kind of necklace, where yeah. you you would put put some piece of jewelry hanging on it and and use it as a necklace or or use it to fashion a leather bracelet. Yeah, which was very common at the time. I mean, this is the you know peace, love, and flower power movement so you'd see these kind of necklaces or wristbands often often made at festivals and and sold so they could make some money i was really trying to figure out well i mean even i remember even in the 90s and 2000s people selling these things at festivals you can still see it today but the 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 thing i was really trying to figure out here captain with the description of this murder weapon mind you it's left on both women so that means Two, somebody somebody either found these at the scene and chose to use them mm-hmm. or brought them to the scene with them. Now, I, I've been struggling for a couple days to try to sort out my head. Does that mean that they knew they were going to kill two victims? I don't think that that necessarily means that. It could mean that they thought they were going to, they, they brought more than one for the purpose of tying somebody up. And yeah, for or, whatever or reason, that didn't than play than out two. of the scene. Yeah. We don't know because we're not, we weren't there. So we don't know if the killer or killers had a bunch of these. Well, and, and I'm pointing all this out to just to state that our current day understanding of the word garroted or garrot just simply does not apply here. Right. That, so don't don't have that image in in your head because I don't think it it applies. So th- the way that it's described is as said 36 inches both of these items and I'm going to call them a boot lace going forward. It, it says each lace each boot lace had been looped twice around the neck then knotted in the back. Both women were fully clothed and seemed to have dropped almost immediately. Earl Friend, the investigator, was struck by the, quote, lack of panic at the crime scene. Robbery was tentatively ruled out as the antique store was not broken into. There was a large amount of cash in plain sight in Nancy Warren's trailer that wasn't taken. And then the 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 phrase that the investigator using, lack of panic, really hit home with me because I, I uh, that made me think that the women were taken by surprise. Cause that, that's not where my mind goes. My mind goes, what happened to them before this attack? What well, was there drugs in their system? Were they, were they drunk? What was there a reason why they didn't put up? Because to me, panic almost equals struggle. If you have a struggle, then the person is panicking or you'd see some kind of confusion or the crime scene would be disheveled. Does that make any sense? Mm -hmm. That's what he's saying. There's no sign of that at the scene. Yeah. So did they do a toxicology report? That information is not available. I don't even, I mean, this is 68, right? So is that, is that even something that they were, doing uh, obviously not at the level that they can are capable of doing it now but were they doing that back then i can tell you this the newspapers and police back then were quite 
I'm trying to put this as politely as I can on there. They're, they're rude, right? Like it's 1968. Right. Whether or not she married Don Delaney, the reason why that would be in such dispute is because if they are having a child together, whether they got married or not, they may want to give off the appearance of having been married and her taking his last name, even if there was no marriage license, simply because of the the shame that would come from having a child together at a wedlock. Right. Today, that's that's every day, right? Back then, that was something that was really incredibly frowned upon. And even like drinking and drugs and anything of that nature would, was way more frowned upon than it is today. So had they found an open bottle of liquor in the living room with Nancy Warren, it would have been all over the newspapers. They would have said, oh, there was a lack of panic because she was she was believed to be intoxicated. They don't say that. And so what I mean by lack of panic here, you hit the nail on the head. He's saying that not because there's no, that, that neither woman put up a fight. He's saying that because there's not, it didn't look like the, like a fight occurred that caused a bunch of destruction inside the trailer with Nancy Warren. Mm -hmm. We know that she put up a fight because we have unidentified suspect blood that was found under her fingernails and she was beaten severely. So somebody attacked her having beat her and then strangled her. Clyda was different. Even though we had the, the little boy saying, I found my grandmother the same as I had found my mother. There's little to no blood in Clyda's case. She appears to have just been hit once. And we get no detail as far as whether they believe this was with an item or strictly just punched in the face. And then she strangled. So where they say lack of panic, and I say taken by surprise, I don't think that Nancy Warren was ex was expecting that there was any kind of that there was going to be any kind of problem with whoever was there. And we probably don't know this, but do we have defensive wounds on their neck as, as you know, like what a lot of people believe are moon shape marks around John Bonet's neck? Do we have that same situation here? Because if somebody's being strangled to death and they're and they're fighting off the attack they might not actually be fighting the attacker they might be fighting the object that's trying to choke them and so we would get defensive wounds on their neck i believe they're kind of like half moon shapes or a moon crest shape i believe both of these women the way that it's been described to me i believe that there's a good chance especially with clyda that she was damn near knocked unconscious with that one hit before she was strangled and i think very similar could be the case with her grandmother, Nancy. Here's what we have here. The, the time of death is difficult here. And the papers really went after the sheriff a bit here for not being able to narrow down the time frame and when the two murders could have taken place. They, they really had a hard time with the sheriff on that. And the sheriff was trying to explain to him. He's like, look, it's not like it is on TV we we can't narrow it down very well. Like so the general time of death for both was simply listed as late Sunday, October 13th, or early Monday, October 14th. And we know obviously in That's all a big cases timeline. Very, very important is the time of death, especially yeah. in this case, because we have one suspect, some might even call him the prime suspect, that could be completely eliminated if the time of death were late enough. It it bothers me this the the weapon of choice now that that's the final weapon of death right is is this bootlace mm -hmm. one level I think having the same bootlace around both victims' necks you go well that's one killer right but then we There's, don't know the motive the, it's the same type of bootlace but it's not I mean there were two of them but it's confusing to me because. We, we have basically the same type of bootlace around both victims' neck. And so does it does that point to to one killer or or is it we don't understand the motive, so it's hard to understand the crime. So 
maybe there was two, and then that would mean that this was planned out way more. But also, we don't have our only eyewitnesses are children, so they can't tell us. Oh, by the way, this this bootlace came from my mother. Yeah, that that's the part that makes it very tough on our end. Is there? It doesn't sound to me like the sheriff's office has a clue whether these items were. Well, items I can't talk to them, but just your gut feeling. What What do you think? Talk to who? Well, I can't talk to. <laughs> I can't talk to law enforcement um, because it's not 1968. But I'm just saying, like, what my gut my gut points to that this was thoroughly planned out. I I guess I lean more towards that this is multiple multiple killers. I don't have a strong opinion on the number of killers because I don't think that there's enough information for me to arrive at any type of conclusion here. I wouldn't rule out the possibility that there were multiple killers because of, I just wanted to know what, what what you felt in your gut and what you felt in your butt. Well, I don't have a feeling Mm. is what what I have No feeling in the butt. I, I just said there's not enough information to come to a conclusion if there was more than one killer. What I was yeah. trying to say is that what you, the reason why I wouldn't rule that out is you have law enforcement in this case that have said that there is a possibility that this was a two-man job or, or a two-person job, I believe is the, their exact statement. Now, and, well, and the other thing that I think possibly points to that and why law enforcement is making that statement is because the lack of, I guess, for better word, destruction at the crime scene, it seems to be a more controlled situation. And if you have one killer on multiple victims, I would think that you would see more confusion at the crime scene. True, but there's there's many scenarios where one could have been killed and then the other is killed later where you don't have to control. You don't have to control to, I mean, one's found inside a trailer one's found outside. Right. I think another thing that convolutes this whole case is that when you start to look at some of the suspects that they've had in this case, a lot of the suspects would point to regardless if there's one or two killers, who's the target here? If, mm-hmm. if this was not a robbery gone wrong, which I, I don't know that I think that it was, but who's the target here? Were both women targeted or was one, the target and then the other was collateral damage. And the suspects, when you review the suspect list here, it it's suggestive that Clyda Jean the 24 year old, it's she the was the target because yeah. of the, the close nature between her and some of the suspects. However, what the crime scene tells me, captain, is that I'm looking at a scenario where I think somebody was in the trailer with Nancy Warren kills her and the commotion of that causes Clyda to come walking over from her trailer to see what's going on. And she's intercepted by the killer or killers or somebody on the lookout and then killed between the two trailers. If that's the scenario, then you go, well, Nancy, right? Whoever's taken out first is usually the targeted victim. If you know the the victims, you know how closely they're connected. So in order to kill one, you might have decided that you have to kill two before you even show up. Yeah, I mean they're practically we they're in two trailers, but they're practically living together. You don't right. get any more close than that. And it could be as simple of a situation as well, if you kill one, you have to kill the other because the other will tell everybody in their in their cousin that I'm the most likely killer. That I'm the one that uh would be the guy or the girl or somebody to look at in this case. The the thing that, that that is so problematic about this case is the description of the crime scene and the description of the evidence that's available to us all of these years later, where you have statements from the sheriff's office that they say that these that they there's no indication that they think that the killer or killers found these leather boot laces, for right. a lack of better term, 
at the crime scene and then decided to use them, right? We've we've covered many murder cases where the somebody takes a kitchen knife from the victim's kitchen and stabs them. And that presents a whole different set of possibilities where here there's no there's never any mention that that these bootlaces belong to Nancy or to Clyda. So based off of that, we can go under the idea that they were brought to the scene. But how much did the sheriff's office know and how much did investigators know about the the evidence that they're finding? Because they give such strange statements, like one statement about these this leather cord that that'd probably be a better description. These leather cords, what they say that they were new. These were new leather cords, but we don't believe that they were purchased recently. Well, how the hell would you know that? Like <laughs> are, they're new, sense. right? Like, it, like I get that maybe they're new, right? You, you would see that signs they're of, new, but we know that they're, <laughs> they're new old stock. You would see signs of wear and tear on this particular item if they weren't new. So I, mm. I get how you arrive at that conclusion, but then how did you get to the statement of, well, we don't believe that they were purchased recently. I guess maybe it's leather. It dries out once it's removed from the packaging, but. 1968 I don't think that you would even package these things right like you that they would they're not showing up you're not purchasing these in in plastic they're not sealed up in plastic before you purchase them so that statement is very strange I I hate to say it captain but I think that the I think that this crime and I will say this in their defense there appears to be much confusion here, and that was working against the investigation. Of course. But it appears to me that this might have been, this murder, these two murders might have been out of their league a little bit. They, they might have been playing out of their league. so much more to get to join us back here in the garage for part two same bat time same bat channel and until then be good be kind and don't